Hey everybody, what's up? I'm back. I'm sorry it's been so long. I spent a week in China and then things got crazy and then last week I was down in Florida helping with hurricane relief and happy early Thanksgiving. Anyway, I'm just glad to be back and making another video. And I want to continue with the networking theme that I started last time. Last time we talked about sockets. If you didn't see that one, you should go watch it because this one's going to build off of that one. Last time we talked about how to build your own web client. So this is basically a really, really stripped down version of what something like Firefox or Chrome does without all of the rendering, without all the graphics, basically just how do you make a connection to a web server and send a request and get a response. So today I want to take the other side of that and talk about how to make the world's smallest web server. And before you get your hopes up, this web server is going to be really simple. I'm just going to focus on the network aspects. I'm going to focus on how to use sockets to accept a connection from a client that's trying to connect to it and making a request and then how to send a response. We're not going to deal at all with file IO or actually serving up web pages. We're just going to look at how to send a simple response. And so without further ado, let's jump into some code. Things are going to look very similar to last time. You'll notice a few differences. One is that I've added this common.h. So so in my last example, I had all of these header files. It's one of the things I find frustrating about sockets programming is you end up accumulating a large number of header files. So for this video, I decided to put them together into one just common.h where I'll just include everything there. And also some of the constants that I'm using, line lengths and uh, yeah, some of these preprocessor macros that I talked about in the last video. Also a couple of functions, the error and die function, which you saw in the last video, all it does is prints out an error. It's a variadic function. It acts a lot like printf, except it's going to print out an error and then it's going to die because this is something I'm going to do very often when I'm checking for errors. The, the other function that's in here is bin to hex, and this is just really simple. It's, it's useful for debugging. Basically, it just takes a string of bytes, converts them to a hexadecimal representation, and then prints them out. And that helps me see if there's any unprintable characters in there that might mess me up. So having all these things in common.h allows my program to be a little bit simpler. So, so let's just jump into main. Now things are going to be a little more complicated than they were in my client example. Up here at the top, I'm defining some variables for sockets, for addresses, for buffers that I'm going to use for sending and receiving data. The first thing I do is I try to create a new socket. Again, this is just allocating resources. I'm saying, hey, I'm, I need a socket, so give me a socket. It's going to be an internet socket, so that's the AFINet, and sock stream, again, is going to be a TCP stream socket. It's going to look like a file. I can send data. I can, I can basically read and write to it just like I would from a file, except that the data is actually not going to disk. It's actually going to a client someplace or coming to a server. And then just like in my previous example, I'm gonna set up my address. This is the address that I'm listening on because I'm making the server. So the servers, I'm not actually connecting to any other machine. I'm accepting connections. And so you'll notice that still I'm specifying the family. I'm saying I'm an internet address, but then I'm specifying some simple numbers here. I'm using the internet address any option. It's basically saying I'm responding to anything. And then I specify the port that I'm listening on. Now you remember in my last example, we used port 80. Port 80 is the standard for web servers. It's the standard port that most web servers listen on. And by default, it's what your web browser goes out and tries to find. Now in our example, I've changed it. I've changed it to 18,000. And, and the reason is really simple is that most operating systems are a little picky about who gets to listen on port 80. And so I want this program to just run without having to worry about super user privileges or anything like that. And so I just change it. You can put it on port 80, but it may require you to be the super user or do some other reconfiguring in your operating system, depending on how things are set up. Okay, so once our address is set up, then we're going to bind our listening socket that we allocated before to the address. This basically tells the operating system that, hey, this socket is going to listen to this address. Okay, and then we call listen. Now these things could be, you could imagine these things being tied together in one call. For whatever reason, they were designed separate. And so we associate the address with the socket in one call, and then we actually say, hey, we're listening on that socket in another call. I guess it gives us flexibility. I don't know that I've ever actually put much in between them. I usually just bind and then listen, but I could. Okay, so now once I'm listening, now I'm gonna enter this loop. Servers typically operate in some kind of infinite loop that basically just accepts connections and handles those connections over and over again until you decide you no longer want that server. So our example is gonna do the same. And basically what it's gonna do is it's gonna call accept. That's actually where most of the magic happens. We're gonna pass in that listening file descriptor and we're gonna say, hey, I wanna accept connections. And these last two arguments that accept takes, they allow you to get the address of whoever connected. Now, right now, I'm not going to worry about that. We'll talk about that in a later video. Today, I just want to accept connections and respond to them. I'm setting these to null. 
just to say, I don't really care who's connecting to me, just accept the connection. And once we accept the connection, the, this returns another socket. So we still have our listen socket that's still listening on port 18,000, but we get this con FD, we get this, this other socket, and that's the socket that we use to actually talk to the client that's connected. So accept is gonna wait and wait and wait until someone connects, and then accept is gonna return, and then we have con FD, and that's what we're gonna use to interact with the client that's just connected. And meanwhile, our original socket is still listening. So once the connection has been made, basically it's a lot like before, except now instead of writing into the socket, I'm gonna read from the socket. And each time I'm basically just going to read a chunk of data. I'm gonna read up to max line minus one, and I'm gonna print out both the binary equivalent and the text equivalent of that. And that's just really for my own sanity. I just wanna see what's being sent. And I'm printing the binary just in case we get anything that's not printable, anything that's bizarre, I'll still be able to see it. And really, I'm just gonna keep doing this until I get a slash n at the very end. Now, this is a really hacky way, not a very robust way to detect the end of an HTTP request, but it'll do for today. Maybe we'll get more robust later. But one thing we do know is that all HTTP requests end in a slash r slash n. In fact, there's two of them. There's slash r slash n slash r slash n. So I'm just detecting the end. I'm saying if I get a chunk of data and it ends in slash n, I'm going to assume that that's the end of my request. If it's not, my program won't work right. Sorry. And each time through the loop, I'm going to zero out the buffer again, getting ready to read the next time. And that's just to make sure that whatever we read is null terminated. So once we break out of the loop, first I'm gonna check for errors. If it happens that n was negative, you can't read negative bytes. So if I get a negative n, that is going to be an error. And then all I'm going to do is write a really simple HTTP response into buff. Okay, so this is just an array. All I'm doing is I'm just printing this really super, super simple string, HTTP slash 1.0 space 200, okay. So 200, so this basically says I'm using HTTP version 1.0. 200 okay is the code that says we're okay. This was successful. I got your request and it looks like a good request. And then I'm going to pass the response, which normally would be the web page that you're responding with. Today, we're not gonna mess with that. We're not actually gonna parse out this request. I'm just gonna send hello. So this is a kind of a dumb web server. Basically, whenever you connect to it, all it ever tells you is hello. Hello, 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 hello. But actually reading in those web pages is pretty simple. You would just need to get the file name you wanted, read it from the disk, and then you would write it into this socket. But for today, we're keeping it, but for today, we don't have a lot of time. We're keeping it simple, so we're always gonna say hello. And we write this response into our connection socket, and we close it, and we're done. And now we can do that over and over again. We can, we can receive as many requests as we want. We can send them back. Now let's test to see if it actually works. If this works, if I did this right, I should be able to point Google Chrome or Firefox or any kind of standards respecting web browser to my new server, and they should be able to talk. So let's see if it works. First of all, I've got a little make file here that's gonna compile my server, and then I'm just going to run it. I called it TCPS, that's TCP server. You can, you can name yours whatever you want. And when it starts up, it just says, hey, I'm waiting on connection, and it's just gonna sit there. So now when we go to our browser, we're gonna type in localhost colon 18,000, and that basically just means connect to a web server on my own machine on port 18,000. If I leave off the port, it's going to try by default to go to port 80. Of course, we're listening on 18,000, so I'm specifying the port here. And if I hit enter, so you notice if all went well, I got it, I get hello. And that's really cool. We know it worked. It's not pretty or fancy, but you just made a connection to this web server using Google Chrome and it got a response. That's pretty cool. And now let's go back to see what actually got printed out in our web server's log. Okay, so the first thing we see here is a whole bunch of binary data. I'm gonna look down here at the bottom and you can see 0D, 0A, 0D, 0A. That's that slash R slash N slash R slash N that I was telling you about. HTTP requests always end with that. So now let's go down to the bottom and see what the request actually looks like. If we look at the text version of the request, you're gonna see that it's a get request. It starts with this get forward slash HTTP slash 1.1. This is basically saying, I want the root page of your website and I'm using HTTP 1.1. So, and then there's a bunch of other information that follows it, like it's saying, hey, this is the host I'm connecting to. I want you to keep the connection alive. That means that this web browser would like to send multiple requests over a single connection. We didn't, of course, do that. We just closed the connection, so too bad for them. This browser would like me to upgrade insecure requests, like the one that's being made right now, to HTTPS. Of course, we're not doing that either. The user agent string basically tells me some information about what browser, what version we're using, and basically tells me who I'm talking to and what they support. So, 
so I can of course change how I interact with different browsers depending on what this user agent string tells me. Now of course the user agent could say it's whoever it wants. I could send the same user agent string even though I'm not Chrome and the web server will just respond as though I were Chrome. So the accept field tells me the kind of formats that it accepts. So, I mean, it's it's hoping for HTML or text, but it'll also accept a lot of these other formats like XHTML or XML. It will accept images. It also has this star slash star, which basically means I'll accept just about anything you send me. Just, just give me a response. It also accepts some different encodings. It's basically telling the server, if you want to compress this data using gzip encoding, I can understand it. I can accept it. I'm fine with that. Except language says it, it's saying I'd prefer American English. And of course I could change that to whatever else I want. Now, if we keep going down, you notice that our server, once it, re once it received the first request, it basically just continued accepting requests and it immediately got another one. It turns out that Chrome actually sent two requests. It requested my homepage. It also requested the favicon.ico file, which is basically the default icon that I want to display for my web pages for this website. And of course, I didn't provide one. I just said, hello, because that's all my web server does. I mean, you ask for whatever you want and it says, hello, sorry. But the point is, is that Chrome understood my response and it said, okay, sure, hello, that works. Now, uh, yeah, give me an icon. As far as my browser is concerned, it got the root web page for this website. And it wasn't quite as lucky with the icon because I didn't give it back an image. I just said hello. And so you'll notice that you notice that the browser display is just the default empty page icon because I, it doesn't know what to do with this. It doesn't know what to do with my response. Now, of course, when you build your own clients and servers, they're going to be more complicated than this. You're not going to send canned HTTP request strings, probably. You might and you're probably not gonna to respond to hello every time. Although maybe there's a use for that too somewhere. You're probably gonna do something different than I did, that's fine. But today I hope I gave you some tools that are useful for building communication into your applications, for building clients, for building servers, and actually sending useful information back and forth between them. And that's all the time I have for today. So take these examples and go build something cool. Build a cool client and server pair that does something useful. Let me know what you build. And until next time, I'll see you later.